Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see you all. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to Westland Alliance Church. In particular, let me start by uh, welcoming all of the mothers out there and wishing you a happy Mother's Day. We're thankful for you and pray God's blessing on you. We'd also like to send a special welcome out to any newcomers, anyone visiting with us. Thank you so much for visiting. Uh, we'd love to know of your visit in a more official way. You could help us out with that by filling out a digital connection card. You can get to the, diction, uh, the digital connection card by scanning the QR code that you will find on a piece of paper that's on the back of the seat in front of you in that little pocket. Let us know of your visit, give us any information you're happy to give us, and let us know of how we might help you. We'd love to hear about that. But welcome this morning. Thank you so much for being here. I have a few announcements this morning. The first is in regard to baby dedications. Uh, we are planning on holding a baby dedication for children of our members and associates on June 5th. Baby dedications, though not a biblical command, are nevertheless an opportunity for parents to make a public formal commitment to God and the church in regards to their children, as well as an opportunity for the church to publicly commit ourselves to the parents and to their children. If this is of interest to you, please contact Judith Gaunt, either speak to her here at the church or give her a call or send her an email. Uh, we have a membership class coming up on Sunday, May 15th at 1 o'clock, so that's just a little bit after the second service. Uh, that membership class will be held here in the sanctuary. Uh, we'd love to know if you were coming, so uh, if you could sign up either by going to the connection kiosk or signing up online, that would be very helpful. Uh, today we are starting adult Sunday school. Uh, today, and Lord willing, the next eight weeks... Uh, beginning at 11 o'clock, taking place during second service, we are having adult Sunday school in the grasshopper room. Uh, this, though called adult Sunday school, is open really to anyone. Uh, if you have teenagers that you think might like to go, that would be fine and appropriate, but it is aimed towards adults. This week they will be engaging with the question, what is the Bible? And so we encourage you to join them over the next eight weeks uh, with a, a unit called a firm foundation in which they will look at some very important things in regards to the Christian faith. Another uh, teaching opportunity for the congregation to attend is Secret Church. Uh, uh, Secret Church is a six-hour deep dive into scripture, and this Secret Church deals with the question, according to the Bible, who am I? This teaching is given by David Platt, and some of the topics that you can see on the slide include gender, sexuality, artificial intelligence, infertility, race, justice, genomics, and the metaverse. The cost is $20, and that includes your dinner and your study guide, and you can sign up on Eventbrite. That would be great. Finally, uh, I'd like to make an announcement on behalf of the elders. The elders would like to announce that three more men have been appointed as elders here at West London Alliance Church. Now, if you recall... We have a board of elders, which is made up of nine men. I'm one of them, and then eight other men. Uh, this board of elders is nominated by a nominating committee and is voted on by the membership, and it's limited to those nine. However, if you recall, we also have a larger group of men who are recognized as spiritual shepherds, and they are appointed by the board of elders to be elders here at West London Alliance Church. Over the past few months, the Board of Elders has appointed as elders Rob Bell, Graham Buchanan, and Lyle Mix, and all three of those have accepted those appointments. And so we pray God blesses these men as they continue to shepherd our congregation. Uh, we have come to worship God. Let's do that with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We could, uh, if we could stand together, I'd just like to start off our time by uh, reading a portion of Isaiah 55. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and for, 
and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know and a nation that that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Let's pray together. Lord God, we come to you this morning, and it is our our desire to praise you and to lift up uh, the name of, of Jesus. And Lord, it is a, it's a privilege for uh, this band to just be the, we're just the backing band for the congregation. Lord, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be part of the, the worship and the uh, communion of the saints. So Lord, we bring our, our hearts, our minds, uh, all of our strength to you this morning uh, to praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let your kingdom come here, let your will be done here, in us. Jesus, there is no one greater, you alone are saved.
Let your glory reign, shining like the day, King of heaven come. And shall be moved, and the power of the gospel shall prevail.
ask the uh, kids to come up and join me on the steps, and we will do catechism before you're dismissed to your class. All right. Great group here this morning. Awesome. All right, kids, we are back to our catechism. I know we got away from it for a little bit, but we are on question 24. Now listen to this question. Why was it necessary for Christ, the Redeemer, to die? Yes. Yes, one of the reasons was we needed our sins to be forgiven. Any other thoughts you kids have? Yes, we're, we're way over there. To wash away our sins, absolutely, and? Very good. The punishment of sin is death. And so he took the punishment we deserved. Listen to this answer, kids. Why was it necessary for Christ the Redeemer to die? Christ died willingly in our place to deliver us from the power and penalty of sin and bring us back to God. That's exactly what you guys said. Maybe we should get you to write a catechism. <laughs> That's good stuff. Kids, we're going to pray for you and we're going to send you off to your Sunday school class. Congregation, let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the testimony we heard from the kids this morning, that you sent your son to die so that our sins might be forgiven and the penalty for those sins might be paid so that we could be brought back to you, we could be reconciled to you. Father God, that is our ultimate prayer for each of these children, so that, that, children, that they would be reconciled to you. And Father God, as they are reconciled, would you help them to understand your glorious gospel more and more. We pray, Father God, that as they go to Sunday school, that uh, your word would be impressed upon their minds and their hearts. Father God, that your spirit would help their teachers and their helpers to communicate your truth to them and love them. And we pray that you would watch over them this coming week. We ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, kids, you can go to your Sunday school class. Now, this is the point in the service where we would normally, pre-COVID, receive the offering. And so, for the time being, as I told you last week, we are not going to be doing that. But we do encourage you to continue to give digitally, either through automatic withdrawal or through e-transfers. And for more information on that, you can contact the church office. If you have a physical offering this morning, you can drop that off in the box that is at the back of the sanctuary, right beside the double doors and we thank you for your giving and for your faithfulness in that. We have a video from some of our international workers. Following that video, uh, I'll ask Tim Seabrook to come up and lead the congregation in a pastoral prayer. Hi, West London. Since we, I was last with you in March, we've continued to hear good news about us people continuing to come to new faith in Jesus. And we want to ask you to be praying for these new believers as they meet in groups and pray for their merging leaders of these groups. Pray that the Spirit of God would be upon them as they come closer into relationship with Christ. Also, please be uh, praying for us as we plan to return to our overseas home in July. And also as we prepare for all the practical things that need to be done. Securing visas, packing up our home and saying goodbye here, finding a new home upon our arrival there, and just general transition as a family. Also, we're really excited that next week we will be at West London Alliance with you all for our last time uh, before we head back to our overseas home. So we hope to see you there. See you soon. Bye. to uh, quiet our hearts and to focus our thoughts. Uh, Lamentations 3, 19 to 26. Pay particular attention to the first verse, 
and the last two. We're very familiar with the verses in between, but it's the first verse and the last two that I want us to really think on here. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence. And Lord, we praise your name for truly, Lord, you are faithful. When we, Father, are faithless, you remain faithful. You are merciful and you are forgiving. And Lord, we're reminded here that as, as we think about our challenges, and Lord, and our difficulties, we are to remember your mercies, which, Lord, are new every day. We are to remember that your love never ceases, and we are to believe in what you say. Lord, we are to wait quietly, Lord, for you. Lord, as each day dawns new and different, so are your mercies and provisions for the day. And Lord, we have hope. We have hope in you, for you are faithful. So, Father, when we are weak and we are weighed down by difficulties, frailty of health and body, and our faith, O oh Lord, in you falters, Father, would you forgive us for our lack of faith? Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, help us to rest in you and to obey the command to cast all our cares, Father, upon you. For, Lord, you say in 2 Corinthians, but we have this treasure in jars of clay, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. Lord, you are our hope, our strength. May our hearts, Father, and lives just reflect that, Father, every day. And Lord, we want to thank you as well for Matt and for Connie and the work that you have called them to do. Lord, we pray that you bless them in their efforts as they prepare to return to the Southeast Asia area in the coming summer. We ask that you would make their way straight, guide them to the place and the home, Lord, that you have prepared for them. Father, we ask for Emma and Quinn to make that transition well too, Lord, as, as their needs and young ones, Father, can sometimes be very challenging. Lord, protect Matt and Connie, their marriage, and their home as they serve you. And Lord, we thank you for the work that you've done in the lives of new believers, and we ask, Father, your hand of blessing upon them. Lord, may they grow in their knowledge of you, and may their faith be strengthened, Father. Protect them. Keep them safe, Lord. And Lord, we continue, Lord, to lift up the war and turmoil in Europe, Father. Lord, continue. We continue, Lord, to ask for peace and an end to the violence. We ask that you would protect those that are serving you, our brothers and our sisters, Lord, in the countries and the areas surrounding Ukraine. We ask for wisdom to dominate, Lord, the decisions of the leaders that are involved there. And we ask that you would protect and keep safe those who are fleeing the war-torn areas. Father, provide safety and hope and provisions, Father, in the neighboring countries. And Lord, we thank you for the day that you've given to us. And we thank you for Jude. And we ask your blessings upon him, Lord, as he opens up your word to us. Father, give us soft hearts, spiritual ears, ready to hear and embrace your truth. Lord, help us to praise you and honor you each and every day. To strive, Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to love you with all our hearts, all our minds, all our souls, all our strength, and, Lord, our neighbors as ourselves. Father, you've provided and promised grace sufficient for every day and every need and mercy's news suited to each and every day. So, Lord, we praise you. We lift up your name. For, Father God, you are worthy of all praise. And, Lord, we pray all of this in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Hebrews 7, 
11 through 19. Now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than uh, one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord descended from Judah, and in connection with the tribe, uh, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who became a priest not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through, the, through which we draw near to God. This is the word of the Lord. Well, this morning we continue on in our sermon series through the book of Hebrews. My sermon this morning entitled, A Better Hope. Viktor Frankl was an Austrian neurologist, psychiatrist, philosopher, writer, and a Holocaust survivor. Frankl, after making it through the Holocaust, published 39 books. The autobiographical Man's Search for Meaning, a best-selling book, is based on his experiences in Nazi concentration camps. Viktor Frankl has written powerfully in that book on the importance of maintaining hope. After enduring a brutal existence in a German concentration camp during the Second World War, Frankl, in his book, told the true but tragic tale of a fellow fellow prisoner who lost all hope. This is what he wrote. A fairly well-known composer confided in me one day, Doctor, I have had a strange dream. A voice told me that I could wish for something, that I should only say what I wanted to know, and all my questions would be answered. What do you think I asked? I asked that I would like to know when the war would be over for me. You know what I mean, doctor? For me, I wanted to know when we, when our camp would be liberated and our sufferings come to an end. What did your dream voice answer? He whispered to me, March 30th. When he told me about his dream, he was full of hope. But as the promised day drew near, the war and the news of the war which reached our camp made it appear very unlikely that we would be freed on that promised day. On March 29th, he suddenly became ill. On uh, on March 30th, he became delirious and lost consciousness. On March 31st, he was dead. To all outward appearances, he had died of typhus. But those who know how close the connection is between the state of mind of a man and the state of immunity of his body will understand that the sudden Loss of hope can have a deadly effect. Any attempt to restore a man's inner strength had first to succeed in showing him some future goal. Now, the importance of the idea of something future which mankind can place their hope in is certainly something that I think most of us would see as important, if not crucial. Well, the biblical writers saw this the same way, and in many words and in many ways, they give a similar perspective on hope. However, as we will see today, not all hopes are created equal. Some hopes are better than others. Let's keep that in mind as we go to God's Word this morning, our passage, of course, from Hebrews chapter 7. Just two verses this morning, uh, verse 18 and 19. I encourage you to read in your Bibles as I read aloud. 
Hebrews chapter 7, verse 18 and 19. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. Now, keep in mind this morning the ongoing line of reasoning that the author of Hebrews has been making. In verses 11 and 12, the author posits that a new priest is necessary for the perfecting of God's people. And then verse 13 and verse 14 affirm that this new priest is Jesus. Verse 15 and 17 point to Jesus' indestructible life as the reason for his ability to bring perfection, perfection being a right relationship with God in this life and in the life to come. And that brings us to verse 18 and 19, which continues to contrast Jesus and his priesthood against the Levitical priests and their priesthood, and thereby continues to convey the superiority of Jesus. Now, the first aspect of this ongoing argument that we look at this morning pertains to weakness and uselessness. Point number one, weakness and uselessness. The author of Hebrews contends in these verses that the regulation in the Mosaic law pertaining to the requirement that priests are to come from the tribe of Levi is powerless and unproductive and therefore has been canceled. He says this, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. Now, the for on the one hand, but on the other hand, framing of this argument makes it clear that the author is still contrasting Jesus to the Levite priests. Part of that comparison, as we saw last week, is in regards to how these priests were qualified or how they were chosen. And that commandment, of which our verses today also speaks, can be seen in several places in the Old Testament. Exodus 28, verse 1. Then bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests. We also see it in Numbers 18, verse 6. And behold, I have taken your brothers, the Levites, from among the people of Israel. They are a gift to you, given to the Lord, to do the service of the tent of meeting. Now this regulation from the Mosaic Law referred to in the passage from last week as a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, we are told here that it is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. Now, the phrase set aside is actually a legal term. It's a legal term meaning canceled, annulled, or abrogated. It's not like setting aside something for later. Setting aside some food to have a snack tonight, it's a legal term. It is a formal cancellation, a formal annulling of something. Now, canceling a law of God from the Mosaic Covenant is, for humanity, a serious offense. We'll see later in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 28, anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. That is the punishment for men and women who cancel God's law. However, in this case, what the author of Hebrews is suggesting is that God wrote the law of Moses. It is his law, and he can cancel it if he so chooses. And we see that this commandment about a priest's lineage has been canceled because it is deficient. It is weak and it's useless. Now those are strong words and we must be very clear that the author is making an argument so his comments about the law being weak and useless must be kept within its proper context. The regulation concerning the physical descent of priests was weak and useless in regards to perfecting God's people. In regards to gaining God's people's access to God through a right relationship with Him. It is in that sense that this commandment is impotent and ineffective. 
In fact, the Levitical priesthood was charged, this is interesting, the Levitical priesthood was charged with keeping man, mankind at a distance from God. Rather than bringing them near to God, they were keeping them away from the presence of God lest they die. And this points really to the uselessness of their priesthood. And the commandment was weak and that it depended on finite men who continually die so that they cannot continue in their office and need to be replaced. And further, while they lived, their own moral weakness required that they make sacrifices, not just for the people, but for themselves. This commandment is weak and useless. But the author doesn't finish his critique there. He continues saying, for the law made nothing Perfect, point number two, made nothing perfect. The entire Mosaic law, like the priesthood stipulation that's under discussion, is also powerless and ineffective in terms of putting people in right standing with God. So the author, having spoken about the commandment regarding the qualifications for priests, a very specific reg uh, regulation in the Mosaic Law, the author momentarily directs his attention and the attention of his readers to the entire Mosaic Law. It's not just a specific commandment that could not perfect the people of God, but it is the entirety of the law which made nothing perfect. One commentator makes this connection clear by writing, the specific command which was related to the Levitical priesthood is the embodiment of the whole law. The weakness and uselessness of that one commandment is a reflection upon and an expression of the character of the entire law. The law as a whole could not effect perfection. The Mosaic law required perfection. That's what was required in the Mosaic law. And therefore, to a lawbreaker, the Mosaic Law becomes an instrument, not of life, but of death. The Apostle Paul understood the gravity of this. And we see it as he writes in Romans chapter 7, verse 7 through 11. What then shall we say? That the law is sin by no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it, killed me. You see, the law requires perfection, but it does, does not inherently deliver the means whereby perfection, a right relationship with God, can be grasped by sinful humans. The problem being the humans, not the law. Now, the predicament of every human being is that of a lawbreaker. Everyone sins against God in word, in thought, in deed, and in deeds left undone. And therefore, the law of Moses for lawbreakers is powerless and ineffective as a means to God. Now, this raises a point of application that might be somewhat confusing and certainly will be controversial. The point of this application can be raised in the form of a question. What is a new covenant believer's relationship to the Mosaic law? If the law as a whole cannot produce what its adherents need most, a right relationship with God, what should our posture towards it be? Now, this is a question that I am going to attempt to answer not today, but over the coming weeks and months as we are in the book of Hebrews. It is not something that can be answered in one sermon. 
And even 20 sermons on this topic alone will leave some people unsatisfied. For today, for today I only hope to open the discussion as it pertains to applying the text. If the Mosaic law is weak and useless in terms of perfecting the people of God, as our verse indicates, and if, as in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13, God indicates that the first covenant is obsolete, then we need to know how we are to live our lives as new covenant Christians with respect to the Old Testament law. And so in this opening discussion this morning, all I hope to do is lay out a few ways in which Christians have considered this question over the years. One small step in this idea of how a new covenant believer should posture themselves towards the law. In the second century, some heretical Christians saw the God of the Old Testament as entirely different from the God of the New Testament. They weren't the same God. And so they jettisoned all of the Old Testament scriptures. They threw them away. That was one way they responded to this issue. Not a good one. Since that time, we've seen many different ways in which Christians have responded to that question. Some believers see God as relating to his people through different dispensations over the course of redemptive history. And they suggest that the Mosaic law belongs to the dispensation of law and is not binding on Christians because we live in the dispensation of grace. And therefore, we are under no obligation to any part of the law of Moses. Other believers would reject the idea of different dispensations and would see all of redemptive history as being comprised of a single covenant of grace, a single covenant of grace that has continued from Abraham through Moses and into the church age. And this being the case, the Christian is obliged to live in obedience to all of the laws given at Sinai except for those that are no longer applicable because of the new circumstances created by the coming of Christ. All the commandments of the Mosaic Law, they would argue, fall into three categories. The moral, the ceremonial, and the civic. Now, the civic laws and the ceremonial laws are no longer binding, having completed their purpose. However, the moral laws are God's timeless laws, and they are binding on all of God's people for all time. And yet some other believers think that not only are the moral laws an obligation for believers, but so are the civil and judicial laws. The civil laws were intended by God for all governments of all times, and they should be instituted and enforced by civil magistrates of every land at all times. And finally, some Christians believe, and I would put myself in this last group, some Christians believe that legally... None of the stipulations of the law of Moses and the covenant that was inaugurated at Mount Sinai are binding upon new covenant Christians, including the so-called moral laws. Yet, though they are not legally binding from the perspective of revelation and from the perspective of education, all of the moral, all of the civil, and all of the ceremonial laws are binding upon us. All of Old Testament Scripture reveals God. All of Old Testament Scripture, including the Mosaic Law, teaches us about God. But we are not under the Old Covenant and thus are not legally required to obey it. Now clearly we cannot possibly examine all of those things today. What we can say today is that the Mosaic Law as a whole like the stipulation about the priest coming from the lineage of Levi for the purpose of making men and women right with God lacks the necessary power and efficacy, and therefore we need to understand that. And Lord willing, we will look into this in more detail in the coming weeks and months. Now, the impotency and the inefficacy of the Old Covenant could be disheartening, and it could be cause for discouragement and even despondency were the book of Hebrews not continually pointing us to better things? 
Jesus is better than angels in chapter 1, verse 4. The readers have experienced better things in chapter 6, verse 9. Melchizedek is better than Abraham in chapter 7, verse 7. Jesus guarantees a better covenant in chapter 7, verse 22. A better covenant which has better promises in chapter 8, verse 6. Jesus offers, offered a better sacrifice according to chapter 9, verse 23. And therefore, the readers and we have a better possession, chapter 10, verse 34. We have a better country, chapter 11, verse 16. And we are awaiting a better resurrection, chapter 11, verse 35. The book of Hebrews remind us, reminds us that Jesus' blood speaks better than Abel's in chapter 12, 24. And it's through that blood that a better hope has been introduced. This is our third point, a better hope. Jesus demonstrates his superiority and the superiority of the new covenant in his blood because he has introduced a better hope through which we can draw near to God. Now, a theological dictionary would define hope along these lines. Hope is the optimistic view and anticipation of the future based on the conviction that God is sovereignly directing the course of this world to fulfill his promised consummation of all things in Christ. Theologian and preacher John Piper more simply states, biblical hope is a confident expectation and desire for something good in the future. Biblical hope is a confident expectation and desire for something good in the future. So let's take a few moments this morning and consider biblical hope. And as we do so, as we consider this biblical hope, or as the book of Hebrews says, this better hope, let us do so by asking four questions. What is the basis for biblical hope? What undermines biblical hope? What encourages biblical hope? What is the better hope of verse 19? Now, as we answer those questions and as we make application, my focus is going to be directed to the women here this morning. And I'm focusing on women because it's Mother's Day. And though I understand not all women are currently mothers, there are those here who may anticipate being mothers, and there are certainly those here who desire to be mothers, though God did not ordain that or has not ordained that yet. Further, every woman present today can be a spiritual mother to brothers and sisters in our congregation. And so I direct my attention to you this morning. Now let us all understand that some women's experience of motherhood has been difficult. Perhaps it's been cut short by miscarriage or death. Understand that we as a church grieve with you in these things. And I would say, in fact, for all of those for whom me addressing mothers is painful for whatever reason, my prayer is that in the midst of that pain, the hope of which I will be speaking will be a healing balm for you today. And so I focus on the women this morning as we consider hope. And as I do so, know that the essence of everything that I say is applicable to every believer. Men, children, everything that I'm going to say equally applies to you. Question number one, what is the basis for biblical hope? What is the basis for a confident expectation and desire for something good in the future? First, let us eliminate a couple of wrong answers to that question. The basis for biblical hope is not human effort or worldly resources. Consider Psalm 33, verses 13 through 17. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. 
The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. We might paraphrase those verses for mothers and women this morning by saying, the Lord looks down from heaven. He sees the daughters of men. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the women of the earth, he who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The mother is not saved by her family or by her finances. The woman is not delivered by her great efforts of perseverance or her diligence and duty. The 2,000 square foot home in the right neighborhood is a false hope for salvation. And the hybrid SUV with built-in car seats and all-wheel drive will not rescue. Women, mothers, grandmothers, daughters, your hope as a believer should not be based on worldly resources, nor should it be based on your own efforts at attaining the good life. No, the biblical basis for hope is to put simply God. Psalm 62, verses 5 through 7. The psalmist writes, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge, is God. Women, biblical hope is built on God. It's built on the attributes of God, on the character of God, on who God is as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the very foundation of our hope as we see in Lamentations chapter 3, which Tim included in his prayer this morning, verses 23 through 24. We see the attributes and character of God, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Now, I think most of us here, myself certainly, can attest to the admirable attributes of mothers. Perhaps not all mothers, but mothers in general. I myself have seen unattainable levels of faithfulness, of long-suffering, of generosity, of grace, and of love. I've seen it in the mother of my children. I've seen it in my mother. And I've seen it in both of their mothers. I pray that many of you can say the same thing. It is a humbling thing to consider. And yet, the godly characteristics of women and of moms are not a sure foundation for our hope not true hope. Mothers falter and mothers fail and mothers fall short of the glory of God. They sin and are sinners. Mothers, do not place your hope in your own attributes as beautiful as they are, and I say that sincerely. Do not put your hope in the attributes of any human being. Put your hope in who God is. He is the only foundation for biblical hope. Question number two, what undermines biblical hope? Now, women in general and mothers in particular this morning, we want you to be hopeful. We want you to be full of a confident expectation and desire for good in the future. But we all know that there are things that undermine biblical hope, and so let's consider just a few of them this morning so we are not unaware Biblical hope is often undermined by suffering. And it has been my experience that mothers are particularly susceptible to the suffering of other people. The grief experienced by friends and the death of a loved one is often felt more keenly by women and by mothers. The physical suffering of a child is a sore child for moms. And they carry the burden more acutely. And when their own parents experience deteriorating health, it's a difficult thing for a mother to live through. Broken relationships in a family often 
weigh most heavily on mom's shoulders. So let us understand that suffering has a tendency to give rise to hopelessness, particularly for those who empathize deeply with those in suffering. And make no mistake about what I'm saying this morning, that is a beautiful quality of women and mothers, to empathize with those in suffering. But women and mothers, be vigilant as you walk with those who suffer. And even as you suffer yourself, that the trials of suffering don't become the breeding ground for hopelessness. Biblical hope is also often threatened by personal failures. This is true for all of God's people. I think mothers are in danger of falling into hopelessness, particularly for their failures as mothers. Mothers, you are finite You are fallible. Sin has tainted every aspect of your life, and your mothering is not exempt from that. And for your failures as a mother, for the times when your action towards your children were marred by sin, understand this morning there is grace and forgiveness in Christ for that. There is grace and forgiveness in Christ for that. And what's more... Mom, you are not responsible for the sins of others, even if they are your own children. If your children have turned away from Christ and are living lives of unbelief and disobedience, understand very clearly this morning, you are not responsible for their sins. They will stand before God and give an account for their choices, not you. Find your forgiveness in Christ this morning. Hand over your sin to him. And beyond that, trust God. Trust God for your wayward son and your wayward daughter. Failure is a reality for which there is a remedy. Redemption in Christ. And so be careful that your personal failures don't infect your life with hopelessness. The final foe of biblical hope that I'll consider this morning is false hopes. When we put our hopes in things that will not ultimately carry the weight of our expectations, they will fail. And hopelessness hides in the shadows, ready to pounce when they do. Mothers, when you place your hope in your children's success, when you place your hope in vocational accomplishments, when you place your hope in financial security, in peaceful family relationship, in other people's perception of you, you will find that those things cannot bear the weight of your expectation. And the ensuing disappointment can light a fire of hopelessness that might be hard to extinguish. This morning, let's be particularly aware of those things which may undermine biblical hope. Suffering, personal failures, and false hopes. Third question, what encourages biblical hope? Women, there are many things that will encourage biblical hope. This morning, I'd like to lean into one of them. Perhaps I would suggest to you the most important one. What is it that can encourage biblical hope? God's Word. Psalm 130 verse 5 says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in His Word I hope. God's Word is the food that hope feeds on. I think the well-known episode in Luke describing the experience of the disciples on the road to Emmaus is helpful here. The disciples on the road to Emmaus were discussing the, the torture and murder of Jesus. And it seems that they were so affected by these things that when Jesus approached them, they did not even recognize him. In regards to their conversation, Jesus asked, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And their response, we are told, is that they stood still, looking sad. Then they conveyed to Jesus the events of the past days, including the resurrection sightings by other disciples, but they don't seem to convince. And Jesus' response is recorded in verse 25 and 26. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? 
And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus would eventually vanish from their sight, at which time they would finally recognize him. And we can see their renewed hope clearly in their response. They said, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened up the scripture? It was in their interaction with God's words that their hopes were lifted. And they returned to the disciples and reported to them that they too had seen the resurrected Jesus. Women, mothers, we encourage you to be in God's word. Be in it early and be in it often. Therein true hope is found and true hope is fortified. Question number four, and with this I finish. What is the better hope of verse 19? We read, but on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. The better hope by which people draw near to God is the better hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The better hope is the confident expectation of access to God now and in the future. The better hope is the attainment of the perfection in view of the argument that the author of Hebrews is making, a right relationship with God, both now and forever. Women, mothers, congregation, the truth is that the better hope is the best hope that we have. The Apostle Paul speaks of this hope in Colossians 1, 21 through 23, where he writes, And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds... He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Reconciliation with God is the hope of the gospel. Access to God is the hope of the gospel. Drawing near to God is the hope of the gospel. And it is the better hope of Hebrews chapter 7. And it's the best hope for mankind. If you want a sure hope in this life, it is only found in Jesus Christ. Because in light of our sin, we have no reason for hope. As the kids made clear on the steps this morning, our sins have as their penalty judgment of God. Our sins have inflamed in God his holy wrath. And we have no hope in our sins. At least no hope apart from God being gracious. And God is gracious, and he was gracious, because he sent his son to die on the cross that we might find forgiveness and be granted access to God who has fully accepted us in Jesus Christ. True, lasting hope is found in the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we repent of our sins and trust in his saving work. I encourage anyone this morning, in the sound of my voice who had never done it to repent and believe in Jesus. He is a true hope. He is the only true hope. Mothers, congregation, we have a better hope, and it's found in the gospel. And it's not just for this life, but also for the one to come. The apostle Peter admonishes us in 1 Peter 1.13, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being Sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We can set our hope on the better hope of access to God now and in the future. This is the confident expectation and desire of future hope for all those who have trusted in Christ. It is a better hope. It is the best hope. May that be the true hope for mothers, whether they be biological or spiritual, and may that be the better hope that we all confidently expect and desire. Amen.
Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for its proclamation of a better hope, a better hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray for each one here, Father God, that they would desire to be hopeful, to be biblically hopeful, to be confident and to have expectations of future good. But I pray that they would do so only in you, with you being the basis of our hope and us seeing that better hope worked out in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I would pray that none would be hopeless, that none would despair. But Father God, hope would rise up in each one as they look to Christ. We ask this in his name.
my source, be my light, Jesus. Be my hope. Be my hope. Be my song, Jesus. There is, mothers, that Jesus would be your great hope, that he would be and you would find in him and in his gospel confident expectation for good in the future. Benediction will come from the book of Hebrews. The response is amen. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.